Hello, friend. Hello. Can you? All right. So my name is Namali, everybody. Welcome. I'm an executive coach and facilitating this session today. I'm a longtime integral practitioner and student. So thank you for joining, everybody. I have this very special guest today here, Sebastian Siegel, who many of you will already know and recognize as the one who turned Ken Wilber's highly acclaimed book, Grace and Grit, into a movie. We've been waiting for a long time. And I say finally, because I came into this integral orbit uh, in Boulder, Colorado, two decades ago. And I remember always hearing from this, you know, like Ken would say, oh, this person's going to turn it into a movie. How amazing. And, and that person. So, and it never happened. And then finally, we had the luxury of Sebastian Siegel taking it on. And you, Sebastian, right royally did it. So before I officially welcome you, Sebastian, I have a, a little bit of information to pass along to everybody. First, I want to thank Integral Life, who's hosting us today. Integral Life is the mothership of all things Integral, with 20 plus years worth of incredible content featuring all kinds of teachers and luminaries from Ken Bulber to Deepak Chopra to Caroline Mace to Saul Williams to Alanis Morissette to David Fuller and so many more, um, speaking on everything from politics to spirituality to art and more. And there are courses to take. Uh, uh. And especially, I would love to welcome you and invite you to join our weekly live community practice sessions. Intervalists can get a little bit heady and sort of stay in the head. So ultimately, Ken Wilber and all integral teachers, including Sebastian, would all say, get into your body and embody all of this. So join our uh, live practice sessions. We, there are daily practice sessions led by different group leaders. If you're not yet a member, you can check out membership for a whole month with just a single US dollar. You will have access to everything, all the practice sessions and all the content that's available to members. Next, I want to put onto the chat field a little document. The reason why I bring this up is I uh, would love for you to support this movie. We'd um, like for you to support this movie in three specific ways. One, buy and rent the movie. We want more and more people to be watching this movie. Two, leave your reviews. For um, audience reviews um, are so much more important for making a movie like this visible over critics' reviews. So please, 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 I've left some links on that Google Doc. Um, watch the movie, leave a review. This will be really helpful. And then thirdly, share the trailer with your family, friends, on your social media channels. Share, share, share. So that's really wonderful. And then um, I also want to let attendees know that after Sebastian and I talk, we'll also have some time to engage in a little bit of contemplative practice around the things that we're talking about today. Finally, this session is being recorded and it's streamed on YouTube. So at some point, if we do invite you to speak and you want to join in the conversation, um, if you turn your video on, you will be on those recordings. So just be aware of that. If you don't want that, leave your video turned off um, and just maybe perhaps use the chat only if you have something to communicate. Speaking of the chat, once I get going, it'll be difficult for me to monitor the chat. So I apologize ahead of time. Um, I'll catch up with the chat at some point. But for now, everybody and Sebastian, welcome. I'd like to officially welcome you to this call. Thank you so much for joining. How are you today, Sebastian? Wonderful. It's great to see you. Good. Great to see you too, my friend. So Sebastian, today we want to know from you about the movie, like directly learn about you uh, about the movie from you, given that you birthed it. But also, I'd really like to explore your approach to working, creating your art, uh, and living your life um, as a practice. Because mm -hmm. You know, I'm coming here from the practice platform at Integral Life. And um, for anyone who doesn't know, Sebastian wears many, many professional hats. Sebastian is an artist, an actor, a writer. You are a published author. 
You are a director, producer, athlete, model, a lucid dreaming and meditation guide, <laughs> and so much more. And I think what's incredibly important also to say is that you seem to be approaching all of this as a life practice. You, from, from what I know of you and what I have observed in you, you are insanely disciplined and you are intimidatingly determined. Like you put your heart and mind to something, you do it. It's amazing. So before I invite you to say more, because we are all about grace and grit today, I'd like to start with um, inviting everyone to just spend a couple minutes with the movie trailer. So let's do that. Five years ago, I met and totally fell in love with Ken Wilber. I always used to call it love at first touch. I never wanted to let you go. Yeah, me too. Has anything like this ever happened to you? Nothing. How about you? Not like this. I ain't seeing nothing like this. He's never raved about a guy, like ever. He's amazing. I ain't seen nothing like this. When I met your daddy, I knew he was the one. That's all I've ever wanted for you. You're gathered here today being bound not only as lovers, but as souls. I've been searching for you for a hundred lifetimes. Has anyone in your family had breast cancer? Not that I know of. And so I'm just going to save the day now, Ken. Ken, I'm scared. Let's make it a new beginning. Something in you seems to remain untouched by the passage of time. Your mind, your body, your feelings all have changed with time. But you know that something has not changed. Something feels the same. I don't want to leave you. I love you so much. Forever and forever. Forever and forever. Mm -hmm. so, so it gives me the chills each time. My first question, Sebastian, is although you have seen it so many times, I'm sure, and you've been working on it, when you saw it just now, how do you feel in this moment? I went into this, uh, I think as I go into everything, uh, what you were saying earlier about uh, determination and also um, integral and philosophy and psychology being so much, oftentimes we get lost up in the head. And um, obviously, you know, to do anything where we feel fulfilled, and of value, we have to be in service in some way. In other words, we have to put ourselves aside uh, to let something greater come through. The little I move that aside so that the big I can come through the big us, the big we. So I think when I see this teaser, when I see the film, I just hope that I have operated in a way that's in service, that does it justice, that does Treya justice, that does Kel, you know, Ken justice that's in service to something greater. And I, the story I think is beautiful. Um, I think it's um, many synchronistic things happened in the unfolding and manifestation of this book into a film, a story into a film. And I think just during the moments, I just, I, I want it to resonate with people. I want it to uh, affect people in the way that the book affected me. Mm -hmm. 
Beautiful. Well, thank you, Sebastian. So I have a couple of questions that I'd love to go over with you. And however way you want to engage these questions, you're welcome to do that. Um, so I've heard you say that, and many artists actually say that the project chose you. You read this stunning book and it chose you. So as a way of getting to know you better, my question is, what is it specifically about Grace and Grid that would have chosen you, that you became the chosen one? How did you so beautifully and even sort of brazenly and so bodaciously uh, <laughs> trust yourself in that calling? In, in a way, I'm, I ask this question also because I think we all have a calling and I don't know if we always pick up that call. Mm. How did you hear that? And how did you trust and jump into this? Well, it's a great question. And <clears throat> trust is such a tricky one, right? Because trust um, is giving ourselves to something and saying, well, I trust it's going to be okay. Or I trust it's going to come out this certain way. And hope is wanting something to go a certain way. Well, I'm going to jump in the pool in the deep end. And I hope I'm going to understand how to swim. But faith is essentially the converse of both of those. That faith is saying, I go no matter what, because the calling is so big, and it doesn't matter what happens. If I drown, I still have faith and that it's for something better, that it's for the best, that it's for the ideal. In other words, that I'm one instrument in this orchestra, and this music has got to come through me, and I have complete faith in that music, no matter what the consequences are of the little I, the little me. So I think that intuition or transrational, this knowing beyond knowing, um, suggests that pragmatically some things, some priorities are important, right? But there are things that are beyond pragmatism that are far more important. In other words, how does the bee know what flower to pollinate? How does the flower know what bee to attract? Yeah, and there's this deeper voice that I, I think that when people when we start falling in love with meditation or poetry or music, something is being spoken to us or through us or in us that's not pragmatic, that's not rational, that's not has nothing to do essentially with trust or hope, but just total faith. There's this music coming through. So the, the questions are pretty, a bit of a predicament to respond to and to answer specifically because I don't know how it chose me in that way, but I do know, right? But it's perhaps just ineffable. I think that uh, if I look at it to ground this now in this world, I, I read the book and you know, I'd read most of Ken's other works before that. And then I read this book and I put it down and I was just annihilated. And yet I was so full of hope that this story you know, it was written in a way, this book was written in a way <clears throat> like no other book I'd ever read before. And in the same spectacular fireworks that all Ken's books are written, this was the one book that was a true story. And yet, in the very delivery of that story, it's first off written by two people, right? That You have two very clear voices, um, distinct voices on the page. And so, as you know, you go into a bookstore and you don't know where to find it. Is it in philosophy, psychology, spirituality, biography? I mean, there's, you know, you, you wouldn't religions, you wouldn't know where to find this book. It would be different in every, in every bookstore. So I think when I put the book down, um, it, it hit me like a bomb. And yet I was full of hope. You know, I was full, I was uplifted. I was inspired somehow about sort of love <clears throat> beyond life, about something that resonates onward. So I think for me personally, um, as an artist, or as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, this uh, story about what goes on beyond us uh, spoke to me in some really deep level, perhaps, that I thought, wow, a love story has never been told quite like this before. Now, and I feel that this chord is important for me to understand. And so I like to immerse myself in this kind of art. So I better immerse myself in this book in terms of making it as a, as a picture. That this is, wow, this is something doesn't come along like this ever. I have to marry myself to this. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it almost sounds like it's the absolute which 
you just have this wholehearted, bodacious trust sometimes. And so in some ways, intuitively, um, what we can all get from that is explore that. Who are you beyond you? Beautiful. So coming a little bit into the relative field, once you, I'm sure, it, so at some point you said, that's it. I'm in. I'm. This is on. This is on. So once you did that, how did you then prepare to sort of like in all four quadrants, how did you then gather together, pull together and make a plan and step into that sense of your inner discipline, your sense of awareness and curiosity, staying open-minded, open-hearted. What did you do with your relationships, you know, around all of this? What did you do with your body, your physicality, your behaviors that were necessary to step into this project and your, your, your external support structures and systems? How did you kind of make a plan to make sure that you're going to sustain yourself through this project? That's a great question. It's such an integral question. And using that integral map, um, I appreciate that. I think that uh, responding to anything intuitively um, and really heeding that voice, allowing that thing to come through, right? Um, we hear this, you know, people say, you know, many different adages, but well, I climbed the ladder really well, but then I realized when I was, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, that I put the ladder on the wrong wall or whatever the thing is, right? We have to heed this deep intuitive voice uh, and follow it and, and, and give, you know, surrender ourselves to it. And then, as you say, you know, then how do you pragmatically, how do you plan, how do you, you know, embody that and, and move forward? And I like to think of myself as just a simple craftsman or just a cabinet maker and in that way, then I simplify everything. I just look at the objectives and then very simply the steps at hand, just very simply, but just go with full commitment into those small steps, whatever, however small they are, that I know that if, if we've got to get here, I can't think too much about here, that I've got to trust along the way and have faith along the way that things are going to change. But I know I need to, at least to get there, I need to get here. And to get here, I need to get here. And so it just starts with such minute steps. Um, so it really started with that. I mean, in terms of pragmatically making a film, first it's about, you know, documentation and the option and, and having the, the, what's called the movie chain of title. Uh, so making all that, that was the first step, you know, agreeing on that <clears throat> with Ken. Also, you know, first, even prior to that, uh, you know, telling him, expressing to him, this is more important than me. And I'm going to put my, give myself in service to this, no matter what. And, you know, I understand this is, you know, if you're adapting a true story or a book, you know, letting the author and the creator of that book know, I understand this. I'm going to put this on screen in this way. And uh, I give you my oath and my word that I will commit to this completely and fully. Um, so that the author, the writer, the person who's, you know, content of this feels safe. And then it's a like that along every step of the way, right? Even if you have a child or a lover or a business or whatever the thing is, letting people know I'm in service to you. You know, we all love to hear that and to feel that, that people are in service to us or in service to the thing that we're also doing. And so I think for me, that's very easy to, to drop into that place, that I feel very comfortable in that place because I feel very honored in that place, you know, when I feel that as well. Um, so I went just in complete service to it. Starting out with making Ken, you know, hope wanting Ken to feel comfortable, trusting me, and then moving forward with this sort of the, the documentation around it to uh, permit uh, the, the things that are necessary for making a book uh, into a film. And then from there, in short, to sort of truncate uh, a long story, uh, truncated would be... Um, First, I didn't want to necessarily write it. I was flexible. I was open to having other writers. So I would give the book to different people who uh, were Academy Award winning screenwriters or new such writers that I, of movies that I really uh, was seduced by and affected by and said, oh, this person would be the best writer for this 
movie it and giving them the book. And it, honestly, Namali was just taking too long. <laughs> it was just, you know, people were just, it's so slow, you know, everyone's got something, you know, I can't stand it, you know, and I'm, I don't like to dilly down. So then eventually I was writing notes about what it looked like as a movie. And, and to do that, I was just writing short scenes, really, mm. about what I thought specifically how it looked. So there was a scene where one of the first scenes I wrote was Trey at the top of the hill in the rain mm. and sort of identifying with the rain and feeling that deep inside. That was one of the first scenes that I wrote just separately from anything else. It was really in a business plan. And then I started to share some of these scenes with people and people were responding, peers were responding saying, you have to write this. Um, this feels powerful and beautiful and transcendent. And um, so then I, at some juncture, then I went all in and, and, and wrote the screenplay. And then there's steps along the way then about partnership. There were a number of different producers uh, who I explored partnering with. And I had opportunities to make this three different times very clearly along the way. Um, but they just weren't the right partnerships. Uh, they weren't the right, they would have had, I would have gotten a movie made, but not in the right way. Yeah, and it was hard to turn those down, a lot of those. It was challenging to, but I had to. One was contingent upon an, an actress, uh, full funding. Another was a large film that would have been 10 or 12 million. Um, but then I would have needed to relinquish some of the creative control, which was okay for me personally, but not in my oath to Ken mm -hmm. and in my sacred oath to Treya that I knew I needed to stay in creative control of this in order for this to, to get done properly. Otherwise it could be, it could go off the rails. It was hard to turn that down in some way, but in, very easy in another. Um, and so they're just keeping the ship on course. Yeah. And then also trusting, <clears throat> having faith along the way, in attaching each different element from actors to, uh, you know, every element and individual in production and uh, pre-production and, and all the way into post and score and editing. Every single person is integral to the life of a movie. And um, I mean, if, if one person had not been on that film, really, in lighting, one actor, you know, the score, the editing, I mean, cinematography, I mean, the film would be an entirely different movie. So I feel deeply fortunate to have been able to collaborate with all these individuals. Um, so long story short, it's having complete faith, being in complete service, saying I am less important than this. In other words, I'm willing to miss birthdays, funerals, parties, whatever the thing is in order to get this done. So there's a clear priority. So everything else gets out of the way. And then the third is then just being very, simple about how to go forward, not being too big about it, just saying the next step is this. And if, if I'm going to get here, I have to take this next step. The next step may be a little bit of funding or it may be, you know, a screenplay or maybe editing the screenplay. Just one step at a time to not get uh, overwhelmed by the thing. And that's how I go about pretty much everything. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. What did you do anything that is internal to you? How did you make sure that you were emotionally healthy throughout this process? Because you're kind of birthing a baby. Yeah. 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 Um, I think that in the surrender to it, um, that health, I suppose, comes through that we, you know, we want to be happy so much, right? But if we look for happiness, we become unhappy. So really we want to, looking for fulfillment is where joy comes from ultimately and happiness comes from. And I think that being in service to this and making this, uh, there's some tumult and there's some challenge in it, but ultimately it's so uh, satisfying. Uh, so during the different uh, steps of the process, like when I was adapting the screenplay, I watched two love stories a night for over a month, right? So that's like 60 or 70 movies in just over a month. So all my friends, you know, who were men would say, what are you doing tonight? I'd say, well, at six o'clock, we're going to watch Titanic and then we're going to have dinner at 10, you know, and then 11 o'clock, we're going to watch Ghost. So they were like, no, this is horrible. You know? And all my friends who were women were like, great, I'll be there. And what are you doing tomorrow night? Well, tomorrow night, we're going to watch Love Story at six. We're going to have dinner at nine. And then at 10, we're going to watch The Notebook. <laughs> right? um, so when I think about the emotional health, I think about, in the same way, small steps. Just giving myself to the process and letting it be fun. I mean, is watching two love stories a night going to end up in a movie being made? No. 
but it's an important part of the adaptation process of the script for me to find out what works, what doesn't work, that success leaves clues and that also, you know, when we're, whether we're child rearing or planting or writing or whatever the thing is, the more content we're taking in, you know, the more we're uh, marinating these different creative ideas inside of us. Uh, the, the, the more music can come out. So I wanted to consume an enormous amount. So I was reading a lot of Ken's work that I'd read already or, re, you know, reading stuff that I hadn't read uh, and watching movies that were, uh, uh, you know, that I wanted to model or, or, or explore things and ideas in. And so I think about the emotional health as being dedication to the process. And then the physicality, yes, that's something that's, that's uh, for me, a prerequisite to everything that I do, that I, that I have to, um, to get. I tend to get heady also. And so to get in the body, every, almost every day I have to do something, whether it's swimming or sprinting or working out or hiking or boxing or whatever the thing is, that in order for me to um, feel uh, in my body and also to just on a primal evolutionary level, um, be in touch with the, that emotional and hormonal flux that occurs when we're doing something that's physically challenging. It definitely puts me at ease and it, uh, allows me to think more clearly and operate uh, in service more effectively. Yeah, excellent. Many different things I heard for all of us to remember when we are hopefully maybe starting to create something, jump into a big project. I heard you saying simplify objectify, prioritize, compartmentalize, some really good advice there. So you were, you were doing, uh, my guess is you were attempting to do many things. And I'm thinking of sort of voices here. You had to include Ken's voice. You had to include Treya's voice, two very different voices in the book. Um, and somehow you were also trying to include the meta voice of the sort of the meta transpersonal voice of integral and also your voice. Um, how on, how on earth did you <laughs> get set about including all of that? It's such a pleasure to be here because we only get this kind of discussion really in the integral framework. And a lot of us have this challenge. We start reading Ken's work, you know, we get into integral and then there's this vernacular right? This, there's this means, it's very efficient for us to be able to operate. And so I, it's so refreshing. It's so wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, when I first read the book, I thought this is a story that's her voice and his eyes. Uh, and then I was met with some challenges immediately in sort of conventional movies where people say, well, whose story is it? Is it his or is it hers? And I said, it's really a story about the moon and the stars. Yeah, as being told through these two people. And then people were like, you're nuts, <laughs> right? You know, that it's too ahead of the curve. Uh, you know, uh, filmmakers want to tell, or studios or what have you want to tell movies very clearly. They want to tell the same movie again and again and again. What struck me about this book and what struck so many people around the world also about this book is that there is, there already are these three voices in there. There is the, the his voice, her voice, the we voice, and then the vo and then beyond, you know, we're four, four, five, and six, you know, this us voice, and then the cosmic voice, the moon and the stars coming through them. How do I articulate that in the movie? So I thought in the beginning, it's, um, you know, their letters and their journals, that this is definitely her uh, voice, right? Uh, and that even after she passes and towards the end of the film, of the book, of the story, it starts to transfer to his voice. And when you see the movie, it's mostly her voice in the beginning and then it becomes more his voice at the end, which is what happens in this life too, that she passes, but somehow her voice carries on through him. That even in the three books that Ken writes after Treya passes, Grace and Grit, Sex Ecology, Spirituality, and A Brief History of Everything, they radically mark a change in Ken Wilber's writing. You know, as people who really have read all his works would call it like the second phase of Ken Wilber's writing, that he's deeply affected, yeah, um, from her voice, that in some way her voice carries on through him, yeah. So it starts more as her voice, and then it, even in his own male, masculine voice, 
her resonance is being carried through. Um, and then in the movie, it's through his eyes so that we fall in love with her through his eyes. Yeah. And then in terms of this, because this story really is a film is, is really a story about the moon and the stars. The story of love that's being carried through all of us at the same moment, at this juncture right here on this call and everything that we're doing, no matter how simple it is, no matter how simple we think it is, that something is, is acting through us in a very sort of Zen way. If we pour a cup of tea, it's the same way that we rear a child or plant a garden, right? Um, not to get too uh, um, out there on that one, but uh, how does that look like in a film? Uh, actor and actress uh, are on screen, uh, so I'm using light and sound particularly. Also dialogue, but light and sound, and I'm using the set as means to express the moon and the stars. So, for example, you'll see in a lot of moments where I, I like to ground the audience here and now, make it very real, so that the actors feel really real, like real people. And then I'll lean a little bit into something where the light is really cosmic and uh, otherworldly so that it feels a little dreamy, which is how we remember and feel about life and then vacillate between those two worlds. Yeah, and that vacillation process allows the creation of this sort of dream state so that by the, end, by the time we get to the end of the film, we're not sure what's real and what's not, but we feel it so deeply because I think we all um, apprehend life in that way. You know, sometimes it feels very real and some other times it feels so dreamy where you're like, God, I, this is so abstract. Uh, and then same thing with the music. So one is the light and then the other one specifically would be the music. Uh, that the score done by Kim and Catherine Kluge here also did Scorsese's Silence. They're um, brilliant musicians. And um, using the music to, in a lot of ways, juxtapose themes in the film um, to create a sort of... Um, subtle you know music can carry us to places that we that we uh don't know different chords you know uh when i say don't know i mean deep intuitive places so for example there are a couple scenes that are, are playful visually in the movie where i offset that with a heavy kind of dark piece of music um if for those of you who've seen the film Ken is dancing in the bar in Germany and he's crying and he's laughing and he doesn't know what emotion he's touching because they're all coming through. And then that goes into, there's no dialogue in this whole sequence that goes into then him coming up out of the ocean in the night and looking up at the stars. Right. And this is a really important moment in, in his change in his character's evolution that there's this point of crucifixion right there and resurrection mm -hmm. that he comes to the surface and he looks up at the stars and he realizes I'm going to lose this woman. I'm going to lose the love of my life that mm -hmm. it's going to happen any second. now. But I already see her in the stars. We're woven together forever. And so as much as I'm devastated here and now by this loss, I am somehow full of hope and at peace with the knowing that we're already together and we already always have been, right? That's transration, right? That's transcendence, that transcendental knowing. So what do you do with the music there? Because um, we see that on screen. We see him in the water looking up at the stars and you can see he's been through all these emotions and all of a sudden he's sort of like joyous, yeah? And then that moves into them, the two of them laying together in bed with the stars in the background talking about how they found each other in one another's dreams. Right. And so when I was scoring, when we were going through the score uh, with Kim and Catherine Kluge, um, I uh, was talking a lot about that scene saying it needs to, and I'd written them a note to Molly because we're on a harsh schedule and it was like three in the morning or something. And I'd written a note saying <clears throat> this piece of music needs to really uh, sound like it needs to have uh, the uh, gravity of a supernova juxtaposed by the twinkle of a star. And then I sent it, you know, and then I went back to bed and it was like three in the morning or something and they emailed me back. And I thought to myself, like, did I really write that? <laughs> right? And, um, and then Kim, Kim and Catherine Clue, they're brilliant musicians. So he says to me, okay, I know exactly what you're talking about, Sebastian. And then he called me and then he says, I just, I just want to know, what does the, this, the gravity of a supernova sound like? 
So I'm on the phone with him and I said, it sounds like it's like, <laughs> right? And when I talk about taking in art or content in order to extrapolate it then or reiterate it, I was thinking perhaps about 2010 Space Odyssey, not the 2001, but the follow-up to that that was where they go to Jupiter. And there's a lot of amazing use of sound with that. They, they arrive near Jupiter and there's just the sound of gravity. And we all know that sound. We can't really say it, but it's like when you're deep under the water or if you're, it's just, it's the sound. It's almost like, you know, synesthetically, it's like the sound of purple or something like this. It's just this heavy, like, woo. it's like when you look at the moon, you can almost feel that sound sometimes. And, I, and so I thought in order to articulate that, what you're saying, this meta transcendent, whatever this voice is of the moon and the stars, that it had to be in, in the combination of the music and, and the colors. So his voice, her voice, and then the moon and the stars, and then these different, you know, then obviously the we, you know, between them. Um, and, and, and movies is a great medium by which to, to, to uh, engage those different voices. And that's, for me, one of the things that I love about movies, that the movies that have affected me are doing so with writing and with music and with visuals. And I love movies for that reason. You know, that, that we can sit in a movie in an hour and a half or two hours or two and a half hours and be immersed in something that we can walk out two hours later and go, wow, that was really transformative that I touched something inside of myself or reawoke something inside of myself that I didn't realize was that alive. And that's why I fell in love with movies. That's why I became a cinephile. That's, you know, we all have moments, I think, where we've seen a movie and, and been affected in some way. And I think that's so powerful. And so I thought uh, this book and this story, Ken and Treya's story as a movie, you know, you know was, a love story and more it was an illness story and more it was a story of courage and more it was a story about eternal love and more it was a story about transcendence and more. And I can do that in under two hours in a movie. I can at least touch that. Yeah. And that's why I thought it was so important to make as a film. Yeah. 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 And, and there are so many moments in the movie where you actually do feel that trans personality or the non-dual nature of the story you are trying to tell it's psychoactive. Right. That's it's we often we say, you know, certain movies, certain art forms, certain things we experience are psychoactive. So I can definitely attest to that. And especially that beer scene that you talked about, it was interesting because he's dancing and yet falling apart. Like you can just really see the complexity of emotion being presented so beautifully there and it, it is it's like we're human and we connect with that so thank you for creating moments like that not just so yeah this time I want to get to you Sebastian like I want this and the next question to be just you like not so much even the movie but um we hear that this is a love story it's an epic love story and when I hear love story and especially grace and grit it is also to me inherently a spiritual story you know if you agree with that i'm curious what is your spirituality and more specifically what what is grace to you well grace i don't know what my spirituality is i, I think it's like the question is so big yeah um but i i i understand what you're implying uh, and grace you know what we started the conversation about putting the little self aside to let the big self come through right that we're gonna die i mean it doesn't matter if it's tomorrow or a year or 10 years or 30 years or 40 years from now what does it really matter mm -hmm. some flowers fall off the tree quickly other flowers stay longer does it matter which one's more important you know we look at a you know, gardenias, uh, you know, or plumerias. And we look at these flowers and some fall rapidly. You know, you walk by a plumeria tree and you see them, they're all gorgeous, right? And, and um, you pick one up and it's amazing, you know, and they're all almost identical. And when you look closely, they're so different, like the fingerprints of a human. Like we all essentially, from a distance, look so similar, humans, right? All animals. But then when we look closely, we're all so fundamentally different also on, on, you know, in these deep expressive ways. Um, where I'm going with that is to say that 
uh, like lightning in the sun. You know, it's the same ingredients. What's more important, lightning in the sun? No, you cannot differentiate between those those things. One is an instant and one goes on for billions of years. And they're the same electrical current that's driving both of those things. So when I think about grace and what is grace, I think about being in service to something and, and letting the small self get out of the way. Um, because, and I mean it specifically like in the most sort of Zen way, that uh, grace has a sense of humor. Mm-hmm. And the reason it has a sense of humor is because we're no longer attached to the I, to the egoic me. Mm-hmm. You know, we're no longer attached to just this instrument, the cello or the violin or whatever the thing is that we're playing, that we're doing in this life. That there's a sense that the show is going to go on and that it's always been going on. And then I'm just playing for a second. So, so who cares? In other words, that then ah, I fall off a cliff. Well, okay, that's horrible for me, but it can be kind of funny in some way. Yeah. And I mean that really in the way to say that uh, when I showed the movie to Ken, he laughed out loud a lot from beginning to end. Yeah, so did Colin. <laughs> when John Mackey flew out and watched it with me in, in California, uh, you know, he's known Ken a long time and he knows, you know, all Ken's work's brilliant. He laughed a lot. And um, some people don't find any funny moments in the movie. I do because <laughs> I'm privy to Ken's sense of humor. And his sense of humor is just that. It's cosmic and it's transcendent. Yeah, that there's always a sense of humor in everything. That is grace, right? You know, there's a lightness to the world that when we're on the ground, <clears throat> we're in the field, we have to take the thing so seriously. If we're playing a game, whether it's dominoes or poker or Monopoly, we have to take it seriously. Otherwise, there's no parameters by which the game becomes fun and engaging. But we can't take it so seriously that we remember it's just a game. Like we can have a little sense of humor. Ah, I slipped up and I screwed up. Mm-hmm. The little I slipped up and screwed up. Okay, I can have a sense of humor about that. Mm-hmm. And so I think of grace as being in service to something to such a degree that we're aware simultaneously, even if we feel the intensity and the importance of something, that we have a sense that ultimately the show's always been going on and ultimately will keep going on. We're just here for a second to offer something. And uh, Grace is, is keeping that presence and that awareness, that it allows a sense of humor, it allows a gentle touch. Sometimes that shows up in relationship, whether it's with a sibling or a child or a parent or a lover, to say, okay, this may hurt. The loss of this relationship may hurt, or the change in this relationship may hurt. We've all experienced that. You know what? It's okay. I'm, I'm going to allow myself to be crucified just a little bit, but that allows us to let go a little bit, which in the relationship with a sibling or a parent or a child or a lover is so important. That's grace. For me, so if I think about that now in terms of what we're talking about, the difference between meta and then grounding it grossly or in this world, again, I think like a cabinet, just very small steps. Just get out of the way. It's okay. You know what? If this thing needs to change or end right now, let it. Let it happen. Move myself out of the way. Allow the bigger picture, the bigger chord to come through. And then the paradox is that ironically, when we do that, oftentimes there's this flood and reward of saying, ah, now that I'm out of the way, I can see something more beautiful coming up or coming through. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think of that as being a grace and allowance, allowing. You know? Yeah, I love that actually, because I, while I know the sort of the word in a dictionary sense, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a native English speaker. I, I speak English as a second language. I didn't grow up in a Christian context. I grew up Buddhist. And in Buddhism, we don't really encounter the word grace in, in the way that the rest of the world might understand it from a Christian perspective. So I actually asked a friend of mine um, who's a deep Catholic, and, and he said it's, it's a sort of a divine intervention. And what I heard you say now is in some ways exactly that. It's like I make myself available to be intervened with by whatever is greater than me. And I, it sounds like you're just bringing that sense of humor and lightness to who you are and how you approach everything and trusting that there is something greater that is there for me as well. 
mm-hmm. and they're there for everyone. I love that. I just love that. Mm-hmm. As you move forward, whatever is next in your life, um, um, Sebastian, where in your life might you be needing grace and grit in yourself? <clears throat> in everything, right? <laughs> I, I, you know, Treya writes about this so clearly in her journals and, and you know, can articulate so clearly in the book that it takes grace, uh, you know, it takes grit to move forward in anything, a certain willingness to get, you know, to get beat up a little bit, mm-hmm. right? It takes a grit to move forward in anything. <clears throat> and then that has to be tempered and juxtaposed by grace. Mm-hmm. So I think about that in every, in every single thing. You know, in every single thing that I sometimes let's, for instance, you know, someone we're close to gets an illness, let's say, or we discover something in ourselves, like, oh my God, is there's a concern here? Let's move forward, do the best that we can. But you know what? I'm going to die. So what? Right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I got to, you know, like, I think that the, the, one of the beautiful things about this story <clears throat> is the confrontation of mortality. And then when we can confront our own mortality, the first time oftentimes people do that, and sometimes it happens for people when they're 10 or 12 or 15. Other times it doesn't happen for people until they're 70 or 80. You know, they confront their mortality and say, oh my God, I'm going to die. It's going to end. You know, and then you see all these reactions, the way people that cling on and hold on and they, you know, oftentimes become self-centered and saying, well, I'm going to die. Like, but then if you confront it early on enough and then you go on forward, then you say, all right, it's no big deal. Yeah. So what? Right. You know, and I, I think that, that then it allows to it allows us to, you know, bring a certain grace and grit to anything that we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because that's what makes everything so fun. You know, that We can allow ourselves to take a, a certain amount of risk, you know, and have the grit to do it, but then have the sense of grace and say, hey, look, I don't know how this is going to turn out necessarily, but I'm going to allow it. I'm just going to give my best. That's all I can do. I mean, even with carrying the, uh, you know, carrying the. Um, torch to put this book onto screen uh, some people would say oh that's a lot of, of pressure yeah certainly i had that along the way people saying that to me and i say well no but i just i trust you know i i have faith i'm just going to do my best and i know i'm cut out for it right at some point it's like it's not if not you who if not us who if not now when just do it do your best Boy. right <laughs> yeah Beautiful. that's all yeah, that's so great. Thank you, Sebastian. Just real quickly, who is Treya to you? You know, every time I see the film, and um, I in the end credits, there's images of both the actors and, and Ken and Treya, and you can see the resemblance. And every time I see pictures of her, and there aren't many out there, you know, but particularly in the end credits, when I see the picture that Linda Conger took that ended up being the cover of the book, which I depict in the, in the film, which is written in her journals. Um, you know, I, I, I look at her eyes and Ken's eyes and I, and I, and I, I do, I sort of pray or, or, you know, hold this ongoing prayer that's sort of been with me, you know, just that I hope that I did this service. Yeah, that I think that her eyes are so piercing. Mm-hmm. And in that photo that's on the cover, the original cover of the, of the book, um, it's just really glorious. Um, her eyes and what comes through there is like a song and a story that's um, the fingerprint of which is in all of Ken's writing. Um, and so it's ineffable. Yeah, but I, I just hope that I'm in service to it and in service to all the people who have been touched by her story um, and to all the people who've been, to all of us who've been touched, you know, by love and by devotion and by sacrifice and by courage uh, and touched by grace and the willingness to, to, to carry the grit too. So, you know, those... Um, uh, her eyes speak in certain ways that are um, spectacular. And I, I don't know if it's possible to put any more, more words to it. Yeah, it's sort of like a song that, 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 that just is, is still playing and always playing. And I, and I look at the two of them, yeah, and <laughs> this intertwining 
yeah, between them. And I just say, wow, what a beautiful dance this is. What a beautiful song. I, I hope that whatever instrument I'm playing, whatever small chord I'm playing to serve the um, delivery of this dance and this song, I, I hope it's acceptable. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yes. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Because I'm sure Treya is uh, important to you. Um, for many of us who read the book and in this integral community, for whatever strange reason, we all love her. So I wanted to just real quickly share a little uh, a story, do a little show and tell. Um, as you know, and some of the others on this call would have known, I used to work for Integral Institute. And so we worked directly with Ken Wilber. And um, there was a time when his Boulder house was being prepared to be sold. So he was living in Denver. And um, he told staff members that, you know, is, if there's anything you want from the house, you can take it. You know, he had already put aside the things that he needed. And uh, already maybe they were in Denver. But what I took was um, this, I don't know if you can see it. This is a sewing kit, which was Treya's sewing kit. And I also took her sewing machine. So I'm mean, just even sort of thinking of that scene that you created on their table full of her art supplies and knitting supplies. And I just somehow feel like, you know, this is so special to me and her sewing machine doesn't work, but I still have it. <laughs> and I have a lot of her things, including, I don't know if you can see these were her thimbles that you use when you're sewing. And so she had this little yellow thimble and then this was her little pin cushion, which I have used through the years. And I have lots of her little sewing items and, and I just wanted to share that somehow. Gorgeous. That's so beautiful. Huh? So, how, and so you're sewing, are you using those either thimbles as well? Oh, yeah. I've used them for a thing. Is the, there? Is the sewing machine there? No, I couldn't pull it out because it's sort of put away in a bit because it doesn't actually work. You have to pull it out, though. I'm so curious what kind of sewing machine it is. I'll try to pull it out, yeah. Not now, though. I won't be able to pull it out now, but I'll try to find, like, I'll try to get it out and maybe even just take some pictures. Do you know what kind of a sewing machine it is? Um, yes, I... Is it a Remington? No, no. It's a, uh, it's a very uh, famous um, brand from, from back then. It's kind of a boxy machine. Um, no, it, it starts with N, I think. I don't remember, Sebastian, but I'll try to. It's not a very good brand. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why the word Nokia comes, but it's not Nokia, but it's sort of something like that, Neki or some, so anyway, doesn't matter. I'll try to find it. And for anyone interested, I also just wanted to really quickly share my screen and show this is the house in which um, Treya and Wil Ken Wilbur lived. And so this is the house where a lot of us staff members used to hang out a lot as well after, you know, but it's now it's sold. And I regret actually that when you came to Boulder, I didn't, I guess we didn't have time, but I should have driven you to show you this house. Uh, Next and time that we have something to do. I, and I've looked at so many pictures because there aren't many taken. Yeah, or of the thing, because I was thinking a lot about that when I was adapting the screenplay. I was thinking about those rooms and so many yeah. occasions. Yeah, exactly. Well, Sebastian, let's take a couple of uh, minutes to um, invite a few folks. If you have any questions. You know. For, you know, right off, uh, the film is obviously out in North America and Canada and the United States. And uh, we just uh, uh, coordinated with our international distributor. So we'll be out soon. That's a, a, a you know, people want to know. Um, it'll be soon global, you know, Asia, Japan, Europe. Um, I don't know exactly the date, but I would assume there's usually a 90 day kind of, so maybe July, August, so end of September, perhaps mm -hmm. uh, it'll be out maybe sooner, maybe a little bit later, but it's coming internationally. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I've already seen it twice. And I want to also say, if anybody has already seen it, I encourage you to watch it a second time in some ways. For me, watching it the first time, I went into it a little too influenced by the book. And the second time, I was able to more fully enter it as a much more dynamic exercise for myself without the book and more enter 
your story, um, in how you tell the story. So I watched it last night and it, it was definitely a very different, much more deeper uh, experience. So I, I encourage everyone, watch it a second time. Don't forget to leave those reviews. And- no, no, for this audience, uh, especially because I think that being aware of who Ken Wilber is, and we're thinking about that when watching it, yeah? And that the number of people who had no idea who he was, I was in Sedona four days ago with uh, Marianne Williamson and I went out there and we played the movie at the, um, uh, to a huge audience. And a number of people had been in love and held the love of their life while the person passed. Mm-hmm. And they were in the audience. They spoke afterwards. I put that online the day before yesterday. Mm-hmm. And we just thought that the movie was so uplifting mm-hmm. that it was hugely inspiring. It was devastating, but inspiring that they had had what they felt was the same experience with their love. And then were there and had remarried or been, you know, with someone else again, uh, not knowing who Ken uh, was. And I was on calls yesterday with the same sort of thing where a guy, a man reached out to me, a dear friend, and said, man, I went through this exact same thing about uh, I had adopted my several daughters and the, the, had the challenge for me along the way of devoting my life to these girls, wondering, God, have I done the right thing? I've lost my own sense of identity. And what he got so much from the film was a lot of that, that <clears throat> loss of sense of identity. But then obviously after it, you know, saying uh, this was the right thing to do, but how challenging it was and how that was depicted on screen because he didn't know who Ken Wilber was, was super helpful for him. Yeah, yeah. And here's a question from Mohammed. Welcome, Mohammed is in Cairo, I believe, right? Uh, yeah, hi, hi, Numali. Hi, Sebastian, how are you? Mohammed. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, it wasn't so much of a question and I just wanted to share a comment with Sebastian about, and, and about the movie, the experience experiencing the movie because for me that 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 it was an experience um there was so many things going on on the screen that i didn't understand you know as regular movies you cannot understand certain i watch a lot of movies but so you know like certain shots certain things you can grasp what the director is trying to do here i didn't get it but then i i i allowed myself to experience it and that's what I just wanted to highlight, that the movie is, in fact, experiential, very much. Mm-hmm. And you know how you get out of it and you don't know, I don't know what, I, what just happened to me, but something happened to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I just wanted to commend you on that, but also to add that, you know, when some movies are so kind of art house that even that kind of experience just flies over your head? No, it was grounded enough to, in a story and with real people and with a narrative, but at the same time, integral enough to, to, to speak to other parts of, you know, who I am in that moment, uh, other than the, just the intellectual part. So I just wanted to say that that was brilliant. Uh, and I, you know, wish you more and more success in the movie to reach more and more people. And I hadn't read the book, so I didn't have any preconceived notions about <laughs> where the story was going to go. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, thanks so much, so much uh, Mohammed. And, and, and I agree, appreciate what you're saying, especially because I think uh, a lot of the, you know, some critics have loved it. And other critics, I think, are behind the curve. That It was interesting. I was thinking about when Ken published his first book and he took it to every publisher and no one accepted it. And then finally, when it was accepted, it changed the world of transpersonal psychology and, and spirituality and philosophy. And I think about this movie is ahead of the curve. It's not ahead of the curve because I'm ahead of the curve. It's ahead of the curve because Ken Wilber's ahead of the curve in the book. The story's ahead of the curve. And I think it's going to take time for people to catch up to it. What's interesting is that the audience reviews are very much like that. And, and some of the critics... Forbes has been hugely supportive, whereas, you know, other critics are just like, oh, well, they didn't understand it in the same way that you're talking about, that they're up here. The power of an intellect is amazing, but it's useless without a heart, and that this movie is experiential. Um, your review makes it so that other people can see it, so thank you for that, and please share that. Those words are, are powerful and important. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. Let's start with Sally. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Sebastian. Hello. I'm really curious when you create an, a project, whether it's a book or a movie, and you've just described how some people know Ken intimately and adore him and others don't know him at all. So when you're 
writing a project, whether it's a script for a movie or a book, and you've got your audience in mind, where do you pitch that with the range of, you're, you're facilitating a communication to an audience and you're respecting them. But when the audience is so diverse and you've only got an hour and 20 minutes, some people don't know Ken's work at all and some know all his books off by heart. How do you pitch that project? I find that very difficult myself when dealing with integral, when I write books or whatever, pitching the audience respectfully at their level when it's so vast, the spectrum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you, how do you pitch that? You know, in the adaptation of the script, you know, the screenplay, at some juncture, I think, uh, I think we have to let all of that, all these other things be suffused into the ingredients. Uh, if we're making a soup, right, uh, or a cake or something like this, that it's going to come out in subtle ways, whether it's in this case, music or, you know, subtle uh, references and dialogue or in colors and wardrobe or in a lot of the nonverbal um, scenes. Um, because we don't want to, in this case, the book's 400 pages, right? And so how do we put that into about two hours? Um, it's got to be subtle. And so specifically, I think, at some point, just like a cabinet maker, making very small steps, surrendering myself to this character. That's not Ken Wilber. It's Ken Wilber uh, in terms of the fingerprint on screen. But it's really just this man. And what is this man going through? It's this woman. And what is this woman going through? And keeping it very, very simple. Yeah, that, the, that those huge things that move us are often told in these tiny, subtle little details, just the look, you know, the response. Yeah, so to try to uh, truncate those things down to make them sort of graceful, um, to use a sort of abstract metaphor in a Zen way, right, that, you know, Picasso would, you know, do this fish and he would do it so many thousands or tens of thousands of times that pretty soon he could just do it like this. And somebody came to Picasso and I said, oh, are you, you know, will you make me this painting? And he said, okay, it's going to take me four months, come back in four months. The guy came back in four months. And he says, where's my painting you've been working on? He says, ah, yes, come over here. And he took him in the garage and he put, uh, held up the canvas and he just did it. He goes, okay, there's your painting. He says, well, it only took you one second. I thought it was going to take you four months. He says, yeah, no, but I've been practicing it for four months. So I think in other words, that that uh, is, it comes across in the subtle details, not to overthink it too much, but just to trust all the knowing and all the study, right, that you're already doing with all the different media and the writing and the books and stuff that that's, that that's going to come through in the poetry through your own handwriting, you know, through your own um, expression. Yeah. yeah. And I think sometimes the biggest skill is knowing in what other words, you're about. about. Yeah. There was a little break. Very much so. That's yeah. Here. And that's a challenging one. And, and yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. What to leave in, what to leave out. When I wrote, when I adapted the screenplay, um, uh, I went through saying what stays in only metaphorically and what stays in but doesn't stay in uh, the same chronology, you know, and what gets, um, you know, how do things get left in? Because we don't want to tell too much. And I like to trust the audience. I, I did, the audience is with, is with you. And, and if they're not with you in the movie at some juncture, then it doesn't matter. But you have to assume that they're with you. Um, I don't run opening credits in a movie. I, I like the audience to know who, what, when, where, why. Immediately fall in love with the characters, be right there with the characters. Yeah, and then I don't like to, you know, I like to let the audience feel things. So I make little jumps in this story that we already have assumed things. Like we don't see her get diabetes, but it's revealed later, right? Or we don't see this next doctor visit. We jump a few months and it's okay what gets left out there because ultimately our story as human beings is an emotional story. Yeah. And then as, as, as writers of poetry or books or stories or movies, we, you know, we want to take the audience on that journey. That's the most important journey. The plot is, is, um, takes, you know, hierarchic hierarchically, it sits lower than the driving of the theme. Yeah. And the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sebastian. We'll take one. Sally, for that question, we'll take one more from Taryn. Hi, Taryn. Hi. Thanks. Um, I think my first question was answered 
as you guys spoke um, and things transformed and came through. But as I watched it the first time, it was a, a deeply emotional um, experience. And then I had to watch it a second time to get myself grounded into, into the message. And I almost think of the movie now as, it's like an object of a practice. Like you could watch it and check in with yourself almost like every year if you wanted to, or, or once a week. And it's an interesting thing because as an audience who knows Ken Wilber and has a, a, a meditation practice or something uh, looking inward, you can approach it almost immediately that way. The first time I watched it, I, I had a sort of a half of an intention to do that. And then uh, the emotion overtook me and then I just watched it like a movie watcher. Like, and both ways are so powerful. Um, so it, what I'm saying isn't really a question, but just an experience. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's profound. And uh, it's incredibly, like as an object and a, sim a symbolic piece, yeah, I, I haven't seen that in film like that. It's such a cool practice you have in making it that way. I can't believe it. It's, mm -hmm. It really was revolutionary and in the sense of a creative um, creative thing that you did. It was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I felt the same way about the book when I read it. And, and so I just wanted to transcribe that on screen that I, having known so much about Ken, that when I read the book, it's hard to take him out of it. And yet it was... It, the book is deeply experiential and the, the, the range of thoughts and emotions that I went through in reading that a number of different times was hit me differently depending on how I showed up. Yeah. Um, just like when we look at a flower, sometimes it's just a simple flower and sometimes it's like, Oh my God, there's the whole universe right there. Yeah. The, what, what, when we allow ourselves, you know, the, this opening and, and, you know, where we're at when we hear the song. Mm -hmm. I think about also, you know, what you're saying, like when we fall in love with music, like um, as a kid, we listen to Marvin Gaye and we say, oh, he's got a great voice and it's a great rhythm. But then once we've been in love and we've been heartbroken, then we hear a Marvin Gaye song and then all of a sudden it's a different song, right? And so in that same way, yeah. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This, uh, just want to quickly say before we close, I will continue to stay on the call and um, we'll be doing a little bit of a contemplative practice. So if anybody wants to join that, please do stick around. We've taken a lot of your time, Sebastian. If you need to leave, absolutely. Just want to say thank you so much for joining. I also want to say something from Eric who posted this, which is true. If anybody wants to understand more about what Sebastian actually did to create this movie from like the whole range of things, a great interview is with between him and Jeff Salzman on the Daily Evolver. That goes a little bit more into the actual creation, the creating, all the steps you had to take, the conversations you had with the actors and uh, the fires in California while you were t recording and, you know, all of that. So uh, a lot of those sort of the uh, external parts of the conversation uh, you can find in that. Um, here, I'm just really glad that you let us into your heart, Sebastian, and you touched our hearts and I can't wait to see what you're going to be cooking up next. And, and I love you. We love you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. We're all on this, on this journey together. It's just what an honor to be here with, this, with all of you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, Sebastian. Great. So all right. So lovely to see you all. Isn't he just amazing? <laughs> yeah we need more people like that um good so what i wanted to explore is just to have a little exercise a little contemplative practice around really getting honest with ourselves and allowing ourselves to ask the question of where as you find yourself in your life right now do you feel you 
need to really call on grace and grit. So you can journal a little bit. Um, we can't, unfortunately, in a webinar setting in this Zoom, we can't break people into um, small groups. But I'm going to invite you to perhaps journal a little bit, and then maybe we'll talk among each other. So yeah, let's maybe just close our eyes for just a moment. Take a really nice deep breath. And just take a moment to rest your awareness into your body, into your breath. And come into who you are in this time in your life. What is presenting to you as a challenge, as a conflict, as a doubt, or as a joy, as a dream that requires your life to show up in grace and grit. And as you allow that awareness to come into you, imagine that whatever this is in your life that is needing your attention, your grace, to open your life in grace to that, to bring your sense of grit and determination, imagine that it is in front of you. Imagine that it is right in front of you. You are encountering it. You are in its presence right now. Whatever that may, may be, a struggle, a dream, an illness, a relationship that is hurting, broken, your livelihood. Perhaps it's your body, just like Ken's body right now, or Treya's body, as it were, your, your desires. What would it mean to bring grace into this? And as it is directly in front of you now, as you imagine it in front of you, deeply look at that. What do you see? Perhaps if you were to even reach out and tenderly touch it, how would it feel to your touch? This thing that needs your grace and your grit. If you could say something to it, to him or her or them, whatever, whoever it may be, what would you say? And if as you rest even more deeply, into observing, into being with this, if you could allow that dream or that struggle to speak to you, what would it ask of you? What would it ask of you? What would it invite of you? What would it say to you? What would it or they wish for you? And as you reflect deeper, in order to bring about this change, 
that you so long for. And in order to show up with grace, to open up with grace and grit, what do you need to let in? What do you need to let in? And as your life currently is, what do you need to let be? Just let be. And if you can be brutally, brutally honest with yourself, what do you need? Or perhaps who do you need to let go? Release and let go. And as you make a promise to yourself, to this dream, to this struggle, this challenge, whatever that needs your grace and grit, Can you identify as one small thing that you know, that you trust, that you can do by tomorrow? Let all doubts go. Trust in yourself, opening yourself up to grace and grit in your own life. And in what way will you act towards this dream starting tomorrow? And if you need to take any notes, you may do that. Taking a deep, 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 delicious breath into yourself, into your body. When you are ready, go ahead and open your eyes. And we'll open the floor if anybody would like to share what came to you, whatever you feel inspired to share. Taryn, yeah. When I was in my um, meditation, I, my grit asked for grace. <laughs> Interesting, yes. <laughs> yeah. or, or just said, you have grace. It was just, to me, I smiled. <laughs> oh that's beautiful yeah yeah <laughs> thank you for sharing Taryn was it Rasa Rasa yeah did it work yes um for me um I need the grit because mm -hmm. I have a lot of resistance <laughs> and it's really showing up mm -hmm. for me right now in, in many different areas you know in for my health mm -hmm. as well as in my livelihood things that I need to do and look after myself so yeah so what is what is your resistance so oftentimes resistance is a way in which I believe we're trying to protect ourselves Rasa mm -hmm. I don't know if you agree with that and if, if so is there a message that your resistance in itself is a teaching that perhaps you want to embrace and, and understand more welcome more even I think I, I'm afraid of becoming vulnerable. Wow. Yeah. So I'm protecting myself. Yeah. Yeah. You're being pretty brave to share that with us on this call, Rasa. Yeah. Is there something that you feel you could genuinely commit to doing, to exploring this inquiry? I need, I need to go back to um, meditation, which I, I, I meditated for over 20 years, and then I took a huge hiatus mm -hmm. for about 10 years. I just kind of went into a different direction, more about trying to stay alive. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I need the grace, and I need the grit yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful, Rasa. Thank you for sharing that. 
Thank you so much. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. Marite? Hi, Marite. Hi, Nama and Molly. Um, yeah, I think um, one of the things that's coming to me is that, um, you know, we've been able today to give, you know, presence with this amazing um, creation of this movie, right? Um, and, <clears throat> and sometimes I feel like we are searching for the movie or the book in our lives or something like that, where then we lose track of kind of the, the real next step mm. because we're searching for something beyond that. Like the, the real next step can feel sort of insignificant um, relative to maybe our, I don't know, whatever expectation or, you know, I, so I find myself just asking myself the question, you know, am I, am I willing to bring refine the grace and grit, even in what might seem like the most insignificant step mm. and honor that path equally with whatever other path um, might feel bigger, better in some way. Yeah. Anyway, thank yeah. you. It's been a beautiful session. Thank you. Thank you, Marita, for sharing that. I'll be thinking of you as you go deeper into this inquiry. Yeah, thank you. Phyllis, did I see your hand go up? Yeah. Hi, Phyllis. Hi, hello. Um, you know, neither grace nor grit uh, have been a big part of my life for most of my life. Um, I've been pulled to do things that I'd love to do, so it's been easy to move towards them. And I haven't had a heck of a lot of self-compassion. And over the past um, year, I've been uh, working a lot towards, towards mercy and radical self-compassion and also towards discipline and, um, and commitment. I have found it's still in the experimental stages, <laughs> but, um, but I have definitely found that that combination of, of compassion and commitment and discipline has moved me to a very different place in my life. And, and I'm really grateful for that, really grateful for that. The film spoke to me, you know, the, uh, the concept of grace and grit is actually very much to me been, um, been uh, embodied, implied in some way in almost each of our practices. I'm very thankful. Mm, oh, thank you for sharing that, Phyllis. I don't know, but, you know, I've gotten to know you through these practice sessions in the last year, Phyllis, and you show up with so much grace and grit to all of those sessions. You, it is yes. true. I hope you can allow that into yourself as you hear that. Thank you. I'm grateful to you for that. Yeah. Uh, Wheaton? I'm just aware of um, how... Uh, um, active I am in applying the way I see the world to the world and to others and um, uh, not so aware of, of, of the enveloping grace that includes me and others. And uh, I want to practice being more of a witness than an um, than a actor. I, I'm fine on the grit side of things. <laughs> <laughs> So grace is still a bit of a mystery, perhaps? To accept it for myself and to, uh, to trust. Uh, uh, Sebastian was talking about trust. Just, just, well, just trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that, Wheaton. That's a beautiful share. I'm sure uh, you're not alone in that inquiry. Yeah, thank you. Um... Yeah, I, I, I heard you mention in, in one of our, the beginning part of this part was uh, about letting go. Was there anything that we needed to let go of? And I hear that so much in some of our circles, these kinds of circles. And um, I often wonder, you know, when, when, when I let go of something, where does it go? <laughs> and, and, and in terms of transcend and include, you know, I I feel like 
sometimes the things that have been let go of come back either as shadow or backlash um, because it was not included. So I wonder if you could speak to that. Is that does that make sense, that question? Uh, Christine, yeah. Yeah, I'll share a little. Um, so what came up for me about that is that, you know, possibly letting go to me is like you're, it's because nothing goes anywhere, right? It's all here and it always has been here. And, and um, so it's, it's um, well, I, I believe when we're letting go, we're letting it go from what we're, where we're at, where our sort of our state experience mm-hmm. and not necessarily banishing it, but, but that, so they're the transcend and include peace, right? That it's, it's like, okay, you're, thank you. Um, this is the main table for me now and that you can have your seat in the back um, or go for a walk or something. And then, you know, when, when it's time to come back to the main table, it's all part mm. of it. Yeah. I love that. How does that ring for you, Marjorie? That makes sense. Yeah. That it, it's kind of uh, takes it out of uh, being attached to something or, 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 um, or feeling like, like, like you, like you need to let it go. You know, it's, the, it's that neediness there that, that uh, whereas if, it, if, it's, if it's meant to go, it'll just go freely, you know, it will be released. It will, you know, yeah, I, I like that. Yeah, yeah kind you. of like catching a butterfly, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I uh, wanted to just check in with Roly. Roly, when I mentioned during uh, the session with Sebastian, I mentioned at one point, I grew up in a Buddhist context. I, I, I don't have a, sort of the, the, the Catholic or the Christian sort of wiring in me. So in some ways, the word grace has always been a bit of a puzzle to me. And Roly just published a book on embodied Christianity. And, uh, and I asked him, Roly, as a dear friend of mine, what is what exactly is grace? You know, I actually asked him just about two days before this interview because it's like if I'm really going to do this interview of Sebastian about grace and grit, I better understand a little bit more about, you know, what is grace? So Rolly, I'd love to hear from you if you can share with us. Yeah, well, uh the 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 typical hymn is amazing grace and and the story of that hymn is, is remarkable and uh, i don't know if anybody or, or everybody knows that but it was written by a slave owner who realized the absolute horror of his ways and it wasn't that he thought through it carefully every step and said this isn't really ethical it was that he was in a sense you know struck off his high horse with the the sure knowledge that that he was not acting in love. And uh, so what, what the Molly and I talked about, which, which was awesome and just a beautiful, I thought, dance with what Sebastian said, you know, it, it's the, when you look back and you, you see absolute clear evidence of, of something beyond you that has lifted you or moved you in, in ways that you really needed. And at the time it might not look like that at all, but, but in retrospect, you know that the divine and the human are, are coming together beautifully in your own life. So that's kind of what Namali and I talked about. And I love mm-hmm. what Sebastian said today. It was, it was awesome. Mm, yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, thanks, Roly. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yeah, there is some new learning for me in that myself. It's like, although I intuitively trust that grace is ever present, it's in all four quadrants. It is available to every stage and state. And yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I think of grace as um, unconditional love and, and kind of a, a, a feminine uh, receptivity that there's nothing that, that there's nothing you have to do to make me love you. And there's nothing that you can do to make me not love you. I simply love you. Yeah. you know, so it's, it's just a, a and, it's, and it's about forgiveness for the giving, you know, it's a beautiful word and it's it's hard to hard to hard to define it actually now that you have to try yeah. to define it yeah yeah 
And I think uh, uh, Phyllis also used the word mercy that I think mm-hmm. big part of it, the whole whole conversation. Yeah. Uh, Jen, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you talked about that. You mentioned that because I realize um, I have a struggle with my marriage, but I have tremendous grace every morning. <laughs> I have to start my grace again. Uh, and then sometimes, many times during the day, it'll, I'll feel the grit part of it where I have to persevere. Uh, and I'm still uh, knowing that I have all just about everything, you know, going to higher levels, but my relationship uh, is just always sinking and I've not spent the time I need to do. Uh, so I need to also give myself the grace and the uh, forgiveness, forgiving myself for not paying attention to it and hope to, to have that improved because it is not a uh, something I'm proud of if I'm, if I'm successful in other areas and have great relationships with others and not my own person who I've been married almost 40 years to. That is not a good testament. So I appreciate it. And then uh, we watched the film together. Of course, we both cried together and it was a great movie, but uh, um, the love was just so powerful. And um, I'm jealous of that. I want that type of commitment. I want to be able to give that commitment and have that return. So um, uh, it's it's just a a timely movie and book for my life. Yeah, yeah beautiful, Jan. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. No, Ali, I just want to, oh, sorry. Thank sure. you for the beautiful meditation. I resonated powerfully with it. Found a... A real physicality to, to to my to the inquiries and a lot of spontaneous uh, arising of information, and um, you know, and when we're saying grace and using that and great as as we go on with this conversation, I feel you know, there there's there's great within grace so i'm really feeling that calling in my life right now so thank thank you so much for everything thank you soraya thank you so much so just taking like a really nice deep breath into our belly deep into our bellies letting it fill our hearts let us each remember we each have our own journey our own dreams, for our lives, where we will need industrial level doses of grace and grit. And may that be so for each of you. May you be well. May you be happy, healthy, and loved. May you be in grace and grit. And I will see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Namali. Bye. Thank you. Bye.